Robert Kim. Robert is a professor of religious studies and direct. Well, are you director still or are you head now? Uh, I'm a director still. So. He's director for a few more weeks <laughs> of the program of religious studies and soon will be head of the brand new department of this thing called religious studies? Religion, actually. Just religion. Yeah. Plain old. Good time old religion. <laughs> Good time religion. <laughs> Yeah. In, in addition to his uh, considerable duties as, uh, as director, he does research and writing on uh, the philosophy of religion, the history of early modern philosophy, and uh, also applied ethics, which certainly brings him to the environment. He teaches philosophy of religion, of course called Religion, Ethics, and the Environment, and Religious Diversity. Please join me in welcoming Robert. Okay, uh, my uh, approach uh, is in presentation is a little different. Uh, I have to read some parts of uh, what I've got here, um, and I want to be sure that I can be heard. Is, is, this, is this volume okay? Okay, super. Um, also, the extent of my visuals uh, is what's here and on the next sheet. Uh, and, uh, th this, is actually, this is actually very advanced for me. I don't usually have this. One, so, uh, yeah. Um, now, um, these are my, my, my headings. Um, my talk, actually, is, is very interesting. This, you'd almost think this was planned. Uh, uh, in, in a way, uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, some of the issues that, that Val has introduced, and then raising questions that definitely take us into the area that Ken has been probing. Uh, so uh, we, we have some uh, building on each other here. Um, I want to begin by outlining some obligations that, that we have, uh, some things that we ought to be pursuing, and some ways of thinking that, I, in my view, we ought to endorse. Uh, then I want to turn in a rather different uh, direction and start talking about religious questions and questions about God. Uh, I want to start by with a few comments on the biodiversity crisis. Um, I, I just got these figures from uh, a, a newspaper, and actually I'm not completely sure if they refer uh, to the UK or to the world as a whole, uh, but they're not that different from the figures that Val was giving, which, referred, which had to do with the world as a whole, I think. Uh, I just read uh, last uh, two weeks ago in the Independent, the British newspaper, uh, that in the 35-year period from 1970 to, 1970 to 2005, land species have declined by 25%, marine life by 28%, and freshwater species by 29%. Uh, as I say, I'm actually not sure whether those figures are for the UK or for the world as a whole, but they're, they're not that far removed from the figures you were giving anyway. Uh, so more than 20% in any case for those three categories. Um, not since the extinction of the dinosaurs has a decline as rapid as this occurred. I find it nothing short of incredible to think that biodi biodiversity had, has plummeted by almost a third uh, uh, during this 35-year period. We often ask questions such as the following about the past. How could people have allowed the slave trade or the decimation of native peoples in numerous parts of the world uh, or the rise to power of the Nazis, for example? Uh, why didn't people who could have done more do more? The global loss of biodiversity that we're now observing is a case in which people who live in the future may feel exactly the same about us. This is occurring on our watch. I'm convinced personally that the situation is unacceptable, and I personally have an obligation to do more. If something like genocide on a terrible uh, scale uh, or a terrible series of atrocities, of course, people are not generally trying to wipe out forms, other forms of life, but we are willing to carry on knowingly with ways of doing things that have this result. This is a sort of harm over which we collectively can exercise some control, and even as individuals we can take some steps. Certainly we have an obligation to try. I lose things I own from time to time, being a bit absent-minded, but for us to collectively be responsible for having lost, or rather destroyed, something we do not own, namely a quarter of all land species, and to do so during the relatively short period since I finished secondary school, is beyond carelessness. It's ridiculous to carry on as if the situation in which this is occurring were acceptable. I think our major institutions, including our universities, are really failing almost completely to do anything relevant to this calamity. Amen. Can I have it again? Can I have it again? Yeah. 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 
A good start that might help a little with concentrating our minds would be a moment of silence for all the species we're wiping out. Or we could read aloud the names of the known species we're wiping out. Indeed, I'm going to suggest to our planning team that we incorporate this reading of names or moment of silence or both into future, into future stewardship workshops. Uh, I think that part of the solution here in my own case, uh, that is part of what will, what will help me to concentrate my attention and energy uh, on this disastrous destruction of forms of life is actually something that's rather in line in one way with what Ken is proposing. Uh, this is for me to see myself as part of a community of life that I have an obligation to understand and to protect. This involves a certain sort of sensitivity. It also requires knowledge of the other members of the community. As with human communities, knowledge of the other members of the community is essential to being a good member of the community. Thus, we are all immensely the poorer if we're ignorant of or oblivious to the various cultural and other minority groups that are in our midst. Correspondingly, we are richer if we know about them, are curious about them, and aware of them. Well, this recognition should also be extended to nature. Here, too, a good citizen, a good member of the community, is disposed to learn about the other members. Thinking for a moment in local terms, such a person will know what animals, birds, insects, e.g. variety of bees, are, are, uh, insects and plants are on his doorstep and share his space, and he will be familiar with the characteristics, habits, needs, and so forth of the other species among whom we live. Such a person will know what the indigenous species of plants and animals are, where they are flourishing, what needs to be done uh, to preserve and maintain space for them, etc. This is part of what it is to, to live with a sense of membership in the community of nature. It should have a bearing on much that we do, what kind of gardening we do, uh, what kind of trees we plant, uh, what kind of vacations we take, what we purchase, what we eat, etc., etc. Um, now, so in general, instead of seeing human nature as something for human use, uh, so that there's us on the one hand and nature on the other hand, with nature consisting of resources for us to use, I'm suggesting some kind of a shift in the direction of thinking of ourselves as part of the land community, uh, part of a, a system that consists of us uh, and the other species uh, with which we coexist. So that's my first set of obligations that have to do with uh, loss of biodiversity. Next, I want to equally briefly talk a little bit about how I think we ought to revamp our notion of what it is to be a success in life. And then I want to ask about some questions about uh, religious dimensions to some of these questions. Uh, success, my second topic. Um, there's a fairly familiar idea of success, an idea that's so familiar that people often take it to be the idea of success. Uh, and for good measure, it has received and still receives some support within some of the religious traditions. This is the idea that to succeed is to become very prosperous, to enjoy material success, to have a lot of power and influence, to be a mover and shaker, to own a lot of land or other property, and maybe to have many descendants. In a world with a small human population, uh, it may have made some sense for people to think of this as an ideal for which people should aim. But the planet cannot sustain a large human population, each of whom has this set of aspirations and each uh, sets out to fulfill it and manages to do so uh, to some considerable extent. My proposed alternative is just this. A successful person is a good member of the land community. It's someone whose life overall is beneficial in its consequences for the basic processes of the earth and their endurance contributing to the long-term health of the planet and of the diversity of forms of life that exist here. It's also someone who's willing to stand up and be counted uh, when uh, it comes to matters such as these. Let's say that someone who scores highly in all such areas is a success as a citizen of the planet. Correspondingly, a failure as a citizen of the planet is someone who is an obstacle to the long-term health of the planet, for example, by consuming or acquiring too much, by concentrating on acquiring wealth for him or herself, or by being indifferent uh, to our global environmental crisis, crises. Now, I know this is all very vague, and there's more details we can go into, but nevertheless, it seems to be a reasonable proposal. Uh, I don't want to say that success in life consists, that this is what it is to be a success in life. Rather, what I want to say is that a, a reasonable, multifaceted notion of what it is to be a success in life has to include success as a citizen on the planet as a central part, especially given our current uh, realities. Uh, 